I think we are live on Facebook now. Okay. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to today's special lecture by great scholar Dr. Surajit Sarkar, sir. He is currently an associate professor and coordinator of the Center for Community Knowledge at Ambedkar University, Delhi, and he has been a photocopier salesman, a bank officer, a primary school teacher, and then a professor at Delhi University. And he has been working on, on a very, I think, a very interesting school of history, that is the oral history. And then he has been, since 2001, also worked as a video art theater and dance production and has created multimedia installations in museums and galleries in India and abroad. He is a city born. He has alternated between working in the city and country for most of his working life and last came to the city of Delhi for his assignment in the, at the University of Delhi in 2011. Since that time, he has been trying to create a continuing exhibition of lived histories of the mega city of Delhi in the form of neighborhood museums that cover the diversity of the city on one area at a time. Struck by the fact that there is so little uh, is publicly known and available about the city, he is most familiar with. The projects under the Mellon program reflects this interest of building society, story of a living city that he has been working on. And as we all know, oral history provides a fuller and more accurate picture of the past by argue, augmenting the information provided by public records and statistical data, photographs, ma maps, letters, diaries, and other historical materials, also the human memory. Eyewitnesses to events contribute various viewpoints and perspective that fill the gap that is there in the documented history, sometimes correcting or even contradicting the written record. To know more about the oral history tradition, we have Dr. Surajit Sarkar with us. Thank you, sir, for doing this and over to you. Thank you, Ishan. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Uh, well, to begin with, uh, Ishan has kind of introduced this whole idea of oral history, uh, but one of the things that usually goes unsaid, and it has gone unsaid even now, is that oral history is the history that is spoken and remembered, right? It is not history that comes out of texts. It's history either we experience or we have heard. Why is oral history important? Uh, if you look at this first slide, the title of my presentation is Creating Dialogues with Memory, because essentially what we do in oral history is uh, we are creating a dialogue with memory at various levels, with ourselves and our memory, with ourselves and somebody else's memory. Uh, then there is a dialogue between an object or a photograph that, as I'm going to show here, and memory. And uh, to bring this last one forward, photograph, how does photograph connect up with memory? We see this photo, these are these two photographs of a very familiar place. Anybody who's familiar with Delhi will recognize this place as Jama Masjid. It's not very difficult. But you see here two very different views of Jama Masjid, which are just about 150 years apart in time. The photograph on the right was taken in 2015. The one one on the left was taken in around 1870, right? Between the span of 150 years, we see a major change happening to this place. Change not only to the surrounding of Jama Masjid itself, but about the way people lived in the city. And uh, to give you a clue, look at the picture on the right. It's actually a picture I took from a Ren Basera, which is a night shelter at Jama Masjid. We had just finished doing a exhibition of paintings made by the children of the residents of that Ren Basera. And from the window of the Ren Basera, you actually, you had this view of the Jama Masjid with the ground in front where kids played and stuff in the evening. You see a rickshaw there on the right. That's the only vehicle, right? The rest people are on feet. Look at the left. Photograph on the left. It's full of vehicles, but they're vehicles of a kind you just don't see today. They are mostly horse drawn because the motor car and the internal combustion engine had not yet been discovered. But 
what does it remind you of to me the closest if anyone asked me to to describe what this picture is i say you know i am reminded of the interstate bus stand at kashmiri gate when all the buses the bheed jo hoti hai wahan pe it's it's everybody there at the bus stand waiting for their transport it's not even like a railway station because you have these individual uh, carriages waiting for people it's like having a number of buses in the at any bus stand and people they know which bus to go otherwise they hanging around at one place is the same story there we have no idea about what day of the week it was what was the event we just know it was a photograph taken in 1868 or 70 i'm sorry i forget the exact date uh but it kind of shows how this area of the grounds in front which are now used as playgrounds were actually at an earlier time notice it's the same east gate but it's on the other side of the we are looking at the east gate from directly from the east here we are looking at from at it from the bit on the one on the left we are looking at it a bit from the southeast now if you notice carefully you will see some buildings on the left of the picture of 2015 the area around jama masjid was full of buildings still is but there is the immediate vicinity which has been which is all clear was it always like this that's where oral history connected with a few written records that exist can help us more about that later let me go to the rest of the presentation uh sorry so when we make history when we make heritage we also make something that people remember the jama masjid was remembered as a place of worship but it was also remembered as a place where people went to pick up their tanga to go to say aligarh or jalaun or wherever else and it is also a place where people who are looking for a night shelter in that area today will go to the jama masjid because they know wahan pe mil jayegi so when you make cultural heritage through buildings and monuments what is it that is remembered so i use india gate as an example now four very very different ways of how we remember india gate 1935 the india gate the top right photograph you see these armored cars of the army coming driving through driving through india gate did i hear someone say because in india gate you can't drive through anymore why because they have the amar jawan jyoti notice the republic day parade notice how the parade when it reaches the india gate actually curves around it on the road it doesn't walk straight through like you could in 1935 but many of us actually don't go to india gate on republic day simply because subah uthna padega ticket chahiye pata nahi kya ek chutti ka din hai par hum kyon jaate hain india gate we go to india gate because in the evenings bottom left picture it's a great picnic spot is the one place in delhi you have wide open spaces which are green trees you have the chai wala ice cream wala all kinds of people everybody is out there playing it's it's become almost unknowingly something that lutians couldn't even have imagined when he made delhi and india gate that it would turn out to be the picnic spot for the residents of delhi in the year 2020 sorry 2020 it is bad year 2019 2020 we are mostly at home but on the right is another use of india gate it is a site of demonstrations it is a site of kind of being uh, talking about something that you don't agree with and as a aggrieved citizen of the country you come to india gate uh, pass out pamphlets posters uh, in this case the people police are coming with the barricades and also they're trying to push the police people away is classically what used to happen what now happens at janpath when used to happen at india gate before that there is a lovely photograph we have at the center for community knowledge where i work which is of the first taxi strike in delhi in 1954 and do you know what they did the entire rajpath from president's estate up to india gate they parked their taxis in 1954 the block traffic on that road these are things that except for the rare photograph it's only there in people's memory and you have to be really lucky to get that photograph if you do so the point i'm trying to make through these examples is that many of the way we remember our city remember a place remember an event is through our memory because actually nobody documents it like that let's go to the next slide uh sorry so 
as part of kind of collecting citizens recollections what ishan had said earlier we do these memory dialogues with the public through the neighborhood museums at the center of community center for community knowledge we have done a series of these neighborhood museums from 2013 onwards uh, shadi khampur which is near the shadipur metro station in west delhi uh, we have nizamuddin which is in south east delhi we done one in meroli which was in south delhi we did one of the kashmiri gate area which is like north central delhi uh, we were ho hoping to do one this year but uh, well this year we could not do any physical thing so maybe next year we will do more so uh, in these neighborhood museums what do we do we collect artifacts which could range from here in nizamuddin you will notice this is a tanga that came out of the garage of one of the houses and notice how well it's kept because it was one of the first tangas in nizamuddin when people started living there in the residential areas of which is now called nizamuddin east and west and they in those days in nizamuddin we discovered if you wanted to do shopping you had to either go to connaught place or thereabouts which was which people refugee colonies uh, the nizamuddin were ref, people coming to nizamuddin were you know people who had got plots as refugees and they could not afford the prices of things in uh, connaught place so where did they go they went to purani delhi nizamuddin in purani delhi remains far it was so in 1947 it remains so even today so then they used to get tangas so some of them got tangas and they kept the tangas with them and once and twice a week either the family or a kind of whole jamghat of people from the locality used to together go to old delhi for their shopping and come back and it really uh, strikes you as you know the kind of uh, memories people want to keep because these are very personal memories nobody is going to actually uh, no newspaper no public record will mention how the first residents of nizamuddin went shopping for their dal atta chawal right so it's only through in people's minds memories and the odd object like the tanga in this case or the few photographs people may have that they kind of collect this uh, if you look at the photographs in the center this came out of the shadi khampur neighborhood museum remember i don't know how many of you are aware that the area that we call delhi today is actually about 350 360 odd villages it's those village lands that we live on today village lands means that they were villagers which means they did kheti badi they did something we obviously didn't have multi storied buildings what are the memories of that and you know the kind of information we got when we did the uh, neighborhood museum at chadi khampur we got uh, anyone if you can guess what this first churn it's a, it's a churn for making uh, ghee and butter very common in village houses very rare in city houses further in the we they, we we know we, you know we have out there uh, the plow we have the sickle uh, the, for weeding and so on and so forth but we also had a couple of other interesting things from one family i don't know whether you can make out in this central photograph towards the end there is two rods which are sticking up uh, dark rods which are about a foot high those are what is called a charkhi i don't know how many of you know what a charkhi is it's a ginning machine before you make thread you whether it's cotton or anything else and cotton did not grow in shadipur or khampur and villagers i mean it's not that cotton never grew around delhi in punjab uh, when the canals came one of the first cash crops that came in was cotton but in the area around delhi there was never any cotton so we were very surprised to see the charkhi in delhi in a house in delhi so we asked people what is this charkhi what what did you people collect the people who have it today had no memory except that hamare dada pardada ke hai mamla then one 70 year old man he got really excited seeing all of this he said i have not seen these things at in the open for at least 50 years and he said you know what we did with the charkhi was another lady also to, told us the same thing uh, there were a lot of semal trees around delhi the silk cotton tree the silk cotton tree the seed when it bursts gives a lot of fiber which floats around every just before summer every year in delhi that fiber through the ginning seed was collected into 
to thread and the thread then went to weavers except that the shadipur village and khampur village didn't have weavers they were jat cultivator villages the villagers the weavers lived in this village which is now called ragerpura in karolbag it was a juleho ka juleha logon ka gaon tha wo and so the they took the thread to ragerpura and it and they used to weave this coarse cloth for them which they collected and used every day these are stories about how villagers in delhi wore dresses wore the cloth every day no history book tells you the story it's only oral history brings it out similarly uh, on the light you know so in these neighborhood museums they bring up panels to, uh, photographs of text of places here i don't know how many of you have noticed on the photograph top right uh, there is a old valve radio we are used to radios as part of our mobile phones now valve radios were huge they were at the smallest they would have been a foot and a half long another foot high 6 inches wide full of tubes you know 6 to 8 12 uh, valve tubes which lit up and what connected connected us to the radio waves be that as it may scientists will be able to tell you this in houses when we think of radio and we think of communication people and if you're below if you're 25 and below you won't imagine that if you had to listen to something you needed a box a foot and a half by a foot at least uh, a cube of that size in order to hear stuff which now we just look from a mobile phone and get it so these neighborhood museums are like temporary things they are not they are not permanent museums they are temporary museums they come up for a month or two in each location in a kind of setting that we can find which everybody who lives can whether they are rich or poor old or young they have a ground floor thing they can enter you don't have to pay entrance fees we take care to do all of this when we set up a neighborhood museum in order to bring up memory dialogues with the public in one part of town now let me go to what kind of other ways we have to facilitate conversations with memory we have uh photographs we have objects and we have some really unusual things uh if you look at the you know the top left photograph is a discussion that was happening in shadi khampur on the top center is when in the neighborhood museum we made a kind of de every as every decade passed what changes happened in the locality is marked in a card on top but hanging below are also uh index cards of paper and a pen and people can say ki oh i remember 1960s because this happened or because that happened and we collected stories about how the first people who went traveling on an aeroplane from shadipur village did so in 1960 simply because they had collected they had kept the suitcase they had used for that first travel you know those days air travel was not so common suitcases used to come which were light which were air in, there was a very famous called air india suitcase and that suitcase was there and the mention of that was there in one of this similarly the chappal on the right today leather chappals like this are very expensive till 1980 they were made in delhi in khampur village they were made and this pair of chappals is the last pair that was made by the person who used to run this little home industry and uh, he said i did not want to sell off the last pair i made because it had a lot of memories for me for the last 30 years this is how my family had kind of made a living through making leather chappals and of course today they don't make chappals anymore but for them it's a very important part of growing up in delhi and becoming what they are today uh here on the left side uh, uh, below in the center is our darashiko building we our uh, campus at kashmiri gate also uh, the darashiko building is part of it the darashiko building is a very interesting building because the building itself has a number of uh, has a story with it the when the bugals made shahjanabad in 1639 darashiko building was meant for the young prince darashiko and he brought his library some parts of his books and things out there and used it as a kind of reading place and a place where to live when he was in delhi when the british took over in 1803 they made the 
British became the leading powers of Delhi and they set up a residency. And which building did they choose to make the residency in? The Darashiko building. It was the Darashiko building. Uh, they didn't want it to look the same Mughal dome kind of structure. So they built these tall, what would be called European columns, Doric or Ionic or something. And it seems like a very European building from the outside. If you walk around the building to the other side, you can see the Mughal structure. But in front, it looks like a European building. You enter this building through the gates, which are there in the, between the columns, and you'll suddenly see the inner facade visible to you where you see the doorway into the Mughal place and the part and how high the English columns have gone in order to cover not just the building, but also the dome because the English did not want to have a dome visible because that was connected with Indian architecture. So they didn't want domes. So they only wanted columns. So the oral history of the Darashiko building, there is no actually written reference of it except for some uh, engineering uh, kind of uh, description of what was done. And it's uh, looking at this building, you start asking questions and then locals tell us about how, how, how I was told by a 60 year old man whose grandfather told it to him. A 60 year old man who lived in Old Delhi, who told it to me, who was told the story of what was there before these columns by his own grandfather which makes it an unbroken 150 year old, almost 150 year old oral history record. And in these neighborhood museums, you also do other very interesting things. For example, the conversation which was happening on the left uh, is about music in Delhi. And uh, the bottom picture was telling us, it was a little conversation about, that's uh, Irfan Zuberi there, who is now at the IGNCA, telling us about what is the kind of music you could have heard Delhi in the year 1915? 1915 was where the gramophone records had just about started coming in. So there weren't many recordings. So he actually made this fascinating half and 45 minute to an hour long presentation of letting us hear the different varieties of music. He obtained recordings, not just from Delhi, but from wherever different places, excuse me. <coughs> One minute. <coughs> so he kind of did a recording of the kind of music of turn of the century, turn of the 20th century Delhi to give us an, a view of how the Tumris were different from today. But on the other hand, the Drupad has more or less remained the same. And much more, I'm not a musician, but these are a couple of things I remember from that entire, uh, you know, lecture demonstration session he had had with, uh, on the music of Delhi. Similarly, you know, Dastan Goi is one of the various, various popular uh, forms of communication and performance in Delhi. And there we had a Dastan Goi performance, but not in an indoor spot because Remember when the Dastans were heard in Delhi first in the 17th and 18th and 19th century, there was no electricity. You would have to do it either. If you were very rich, you would do it under lamplight. If you're not rich, you would do it in the open. So we did it on the roof of the Yamuna Bazar Ghat houses, buildings that have remained in Delhi just the way they were for the last 200 odd years. And we did it on the roof of one of those houses and at sunset, uh, of course, uh, we were told by the person whose house it was, Ki, please don't do this immediately after sunset. Ek bar, uh, din doob jati hai, to bahut sare aa jate. So time it so that you can finish your performance at sunset, and which is exactly what we did. I go on to the next, uh, sorry, uh, the next one. Here is actually a video which I would like to play. This is a dialogue with memory from somewhere else, from actually Imphal in Manipur, in the Imphal Valley, a couple of places. Let me, it's a very short, about three minute video.
So it, it, it wasn't subtitled, uh, but what I want to tell you is, uh, the, as it says in the text on the side, the theme was about the unregulated flooding. See, Imphal Valley in Manipur is a place where three rivers enter and only one river moves out. So if there is extra rain or if, if the rainfall is little more than normal, it really floods up. And in this particular time, what was happening in 2004 was it was excessive rain and there was a lot of flooding across the town. So people were trying to protect the houses by setting up barricades between houses. And that was kind of uh, stopping the flow of water from into entering one place. But on the other hand, you know, you can't stop water. It doesn't go this way, it goes around it. And then it goes to the next colony. So the people were kind of, uh, colonies started, neighboring colonies started fighting with each other. and one, the whole thing became, how does one get residents of the same town to actually talk about what's happening to them rather than picking up a fight and not being able to solve the problem. So we did this uh, traveling performance of the kind you just saw, which was very simple. It had uh, local performers talking about what? Talking about the video that was taken of the flooding in the locality so that was the visuals that they were watching. And what was what they were hearing? If you notice the lady who had come to speak, she was reading out from an amazing piece of work, which was which we found written, handwritten text dating back 400 years, lying in the the Binodini Devi, the, the, the royal library in the in their home, the domestic library of the royal family, called the Tutan Long. Which, is, which was basically a, a record of how the water flows in the Imphal Valley written 400 years ago and completely ignored once modernization took over. So what we did was since it was broken up into villagers and villages and regions, we used to take a video of the place as it is today and then get somebody who lived there to read out the text of 400 years ago. And it was amazing the response because people are hearing what makes sense written in the past and the complete abdication of common sense in the present. This led to a kind of discussion. Uh, uh, people kind of made songs about it. They made plays about it. And all of it was performed live at the venue. All of this happened over a period of two months while this rain was happening. And so much so, you know, the, the kind of amount of oral histories about waterlogging and flooding that was collected at that time 
was so enormous that actually the Imphal city municipality actually came forward and started recording these events, saying that we don't get this information otherwise. It's only there in people's memories or I didn't, in people's homes, memories. Maybe somebody has some document which they read out, like the gentleman out there was talking. Uh, many people came up to speak and in order to show that this was common to all, whoever spoke, there was a screen because we were showing the video, the same screen showed the person's face. And you may have seen a person's face out there who was also, you, you saw the queen's face, face out there and you see also a local resident. It didn't matter who you were, everybody got the same. It was a complete democratic space, this thing. And it led to a really phenomenal exchange of ideas and information, uh, something that only oral history brought forward. I go now to the next, uh, again, the, I moved to Nagaland here where we are kind of at the center, we are working with the Konyak Heritage Center to help them set up a museum, a community museum. Uh, now, remember, like many other parts of the world uh, in which literacy has come in in the recent past, uh, in the hills, especially hill areas, the hills of Northeast uh, Nagaland, literacy is also recent. It's about within a generation or two. So much so that while the people call themselves Christian today, uh, it is still possible to find out who translated the Bible into their local language. And in the picture on the right, the person in the center is the priest who actually translated the Bible into the Konyak language. And we had a discussion with him after having gone through, uh, spent many uh, long time. Uh, the discussion was basically as a person who translated the Bible, do you feel that there is something that uh, this kind of transformation uh, you feel sad about? And he said, yes, we do feel sad. And all of us think about it. And we are setting up these heritage centers in order to remember who we were. Because in this initial flush of enthusiasm to adopt a written language, the word he used was, we threw away the baby along with the bath water. Matlab, jo thi, unko bhi out kar diya. Bura to, jo bura laga, wo to out kari diya, saath mein sab kuch aur. And they're trying to kind of recollect their old traditions once again. Which, in a place which is largely oral still, you have to rely totally on people's memory. So we have a team of people who are the, the person in front and the photo on the left is a faculty in Ambedkar University. And at the back is one of the members of the Konyak Heritage Center. And we all kind of go together, uh, look at places as scholars working in this area of oral history and uh, interested in history and heritage. We kind of look as, histo as people who are historians, uh, look at an object and say, you know, if, you, if it has been carved like this, means this type of tools are here, so who here? would have used that kind of tool. Or where will this kind of weave come from? You know, there are a lot of questions that come out of just looking at an artifact. And then of course we have people who know histories, like you have on the, here, the person on the left, uh, when we just, want to, uh, we just wanted to know who is the person who can tell us most about the plants in the region. We were taken to this person who actually is lame. And we're saying, how does he know about I mean, the thought in my mind was, how does somebody like him know a lot about the trees? He must have gone traveling, but he's lame right now. And not just lame, he had lost a leg. And then we discovered he had lost a leg because in his trips in the jungle, one day, like a log fell on him. And he had this accident, but still, he's like a single percent Wikipedia on plant life in the Patkai range. Amazing person. Uh, so people, places, objects, memories, they all connect together in very many complicated ways. I mean, here we have a letter written by Nehru in 1955 to the block education officer of what was then uh, the Naga territories, right? And he mentions out there, I heard some time ago that in some of the schools, Raghupati Raghav Rajaram was taught to be understood. This seemed to be totally inappropriate. None of the boys and girls in these areas have the faintest conception of what this means. It's a point he's making. 
that you have to introduce their language, their cultures, their language, uh, in their histories into education. Without it, it's not going to work. People are not going to get excited about going to school. Let me go to the next slide. So in this whole, you know, what I call, I call the, this thing provoking memory, uh, going to kind of, uh, going to places and setting up situations by which people feel obliged to answer you because finally who was who are who am i in my personal experience many of the places i've gone i am not local resident i know a few i have a few friends there who have called me there but that doesn't give me any uh, right to claim to be an expert or know everything about the place i can only want to know more and uh, so I'll give you, uh, we've heard of headhunting. Uh, maybe some of you would have heard of headhunting from the past. You know, uh, when we were looking uh, we've in, in one house, we found uh, the, the, the family had kept their father's uh, diaries because he was what was called a Dobashi, a translator for the administrators of the colonial times and in the early independence years. And he had made a copy of the, uh, a, a diary of whatever used to be submitted. Of his his own diary, and in that diary, I was looking at it, and I found that uh, you know head hunting continued till the nineteen sixties. But what is more interesting is the penalty for head hunting, for kind of taking a human life for this, uh, the fine that was given collectively for the village was almost as much, sometimes less then cutting certain specific kind of trees. And these fines were not made by administrators. They were made by administrators, by the local headmen and so on in consultation. And the question was, why were certain kind of trees given more value than life? And I couldn't get an answer to that question and I thought I should ask, but I remember, uh, going to another village, the village of Chui. And uh, in there, I found a very interesting way to arrive at an answer. I went to that village as part of my travels there because Chui was a place where another anthropologist called Führer Heimendorf had gone in the 1970s and taken some uh, films, uh, 16 mm, 8 mm films. And he had deposited his collections with the University of Cambridge. So my friends in Cambridge, when they heard I was going there, they said, why don't you do one thing? We want to return to the villages where villages where these films were taken, a copy of these films, so they know what was taken at that time. So would you mind carrying them for us? I said, no, not at all, absolutely. I'll go and not only uh, give it to them, I will also play it for them so they'll see what it is. This is a very short clip. And uh, you can see out there in the background, all the skulls and stuff, but Oops, the clip is not playing, I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, it's a very short clip, 10, 12 seconds. After the clip got played, a lot of people started talking. And I asked my friend, what are they talking about? I mean, I haven't even asked them a question. Something has obviously uh, triggered a lot of conversation. What is it? He said, you know, it's very, uh, it's not all that surprising. What they're trying to find out is in front of whose house and what is this building in front of which this dance is happening? Because a dance with skulls is a very ritual important dance and it's not done everywhere. It's like, you know, some ceremonies, some ritual ceremonies happen in a temple or in the puja room in your house or places like that. So something which is as ritual as this and as important to their old way of thinking, they need to know where it was happening and the entire discussion was trying to guess where this dance may have been happening. From that we got into a discussion about the kind of walls that these buildings had and then where would all of these be kept and so on. You know these skulls and stuff, be, would they be kept or would they be buried or what? And That's a long story in itself. Okay then uh, in order to find to come back to this whole thing of provoking conversation, oral history is all about what, getting people to talk about it. Uh, 
the photographs on the top is from the Bodo community. And it's a very common, it's a, um, it's the equivalent of a ritual, uh, a kind of cloth which is given a cloth of honor. It's like a scarf, right? But in the classical yellow color. And the photo on the left is from a photograph from 19, uh, early 80s in Delhi, not early, mid 80s in Delhi, <coughs> when a lot of uh, the kind of tribal communities in Delhi, the, the Assam, um, the people in Assam were very restive, the communities were not very sure and uh, they wanted, the, the, there was a difference between the various kind of communities there. Then there was this whole, it, it led to the whole Assam movement about recognition of Assam as a territory and so on, as a place and a people and so on and so forth. But uh, if you look at this, you'll notice that people are in the 80s were wearing shawls of different colors, even the men. But today, if you go, the predominant color of these shawls is the mustard yellow. And uh, the question then became, what happened to all these other colors? Why doesn't one see so many of these uh, in the Bodo shawls? The dominance of mustard is obviously not as much as it, as it used to be even 40 years ago. And that in itself, the questions of that led to really interesting conversations. People ended up doing research on it about how, as a part of this mobilization, what was happening was, uh, in order to kind of create an identity for yourself, uh, for the community, the there was a kind of way by which other uh, colors and designs were dropped, and only a few were chosen to represent the borders. So, in a sense, in a sense, uh, as times became uh, disturbed and society became in ferment. One of the things that happened it it's, it narrowed down the create possibility for creative expression of whatever idea you have, which is not very uncommon. Is the same story everywhere. At times when people feel something is disturbed, we kind of uh, move in, look inward, and take up a very narrow view of things. Whereas actually, a community has a much wider way of expressing itself. And taking the narrow view actually misses out many of the other dimensions of a community's life. Uh, this next, uh, the next set of photographs at the bottom is a very interesting and the first of its kind. See the Indian Museum at Kolkata has got one of the largest collections of what is called anthropological artifacts from India dating back to almost 300 or so years. And it has the largest collection from Northeast India. But like in many collections, much of this collection is actually kept in reserve and is not shown to the public, partly because information about what these are is not known. So then we initiated a series of, uh, we kind of got people from the communities from different tribes in the Northeast to come to Kolkata, to the Indian Museum. The Indian Museum uh, very gratefully opened out its collection and put these out on the table. And then here you can see people looking at these objects and the local community members kind of discussing amongst themselves about what used to happen, where they heard about these objects in the past. Sometimes even phone calls were made in order to get a fuller picture of what these objects were and what they representative, represented about society at the time. Very important because remember, most of these objects that came were brought by uh, British colonial administrators who just said obtained from so and so village or so and so district or so and so major so and so gave it to me. That's all. To, to find anything else about an object, you have to go back to the source community and get them to talk about it. Oral history has a very important anthropological and historical, uh, is of great anthropological historical relevance as well. Now, here we are going to a very interesting part of oral history when it comes to agriculture. You know, even today, whether you like it or not, 50% of this country, still rural, uh, has something or the other to do with agriculture. 
Some would say even more than 50, but whatever it may, a large part of the country. But as many agriculturists tell us, uh, in the last generation, there's been this whole shift towards modern, progressive, high yielding crops. And a lot of our agricultural past history has been kind of forgotten. Uh, and nobody's, very few people have taken the trouble to actually go and document it. So as part of the exercise of documenting uh, agricultural histories from villages and families, because finally, what is agriculture? It's what a family does for a living, which means you have to go to the family to find out what they did for a living a generation ago, two generations ago. And as the photograph on the right shows, what we are doing is collecting, I don't know how many of you recognize what these objects on the top are. They are uh, different parts of the country. They are measures in the age, in the days before kilograms and grams and centimeters and inches, people had measures, the pi, the say, you know, by which grain was gathered and weighed. So, uh, so many say makes, makes a man. You may have heard of these phrases, but they are finally a measure. And here is a measure in the central photograph on the uh, top, uh, second from the right photograph, is actually a 80 or 90 year old because the family couldn't exactly date it. They said it's almost about three generations old, uh, grandmother's time, uh, the lady out there who's 93 or 94, we calculated. Uh, and the questions to her was, what were the grains that, were, that you see being measured in this from when you were a child? And in that way, through conversations about what the grains were, the songs that she used to remember at harvest time and how the songs change as the grains change and so on and so forth, you build a picture of the transformations of agriculture at a village life. And therefore, how, how many people continued to be involved with it and how many people had to leave as the, in the last generation it became more mechanized uh, more electricity electrified and all of that so a lot of artifacts that needed human power didn't exist so the number of people needed on the land also dropped all of these farming histories and narratives come from collections like this using oral history am i all right on time or maybe another five seven minutes more uh, so these kind of collections uh, what we have also done in the past, if you look at that website, you will see uh, these collections have been exhibited locally. Like we do the neighborhood museums in Delhi, we used to do these shows in village, small towns. You know, the picture on the top left is actually uh, a screen in a village square. And that crowd of people just watching it because it's got their own village people telling stories about their own village and villages around describing stories of their land. So the younger people learned something and the older people said, but you never asked me. And I can say this much more. And it again provoked conversation. Uh, here we tried to do the same exhibition was done in Bhopal. And here we did an indoor space trying to kind of convey, get some local artists to kind of use a few televisions and make an installation out of it. Uh, how are students connected with all of this? Well, as far as I can tell you, I've been collecting oral histories from different parts of the country from around 2002 or 2003. And all of it has happened with student help. Here on the top right are two people who are no longer with us today. Uh, R.V. Smith on the left and Lala Narayan Prasad, uh, Narayan Prasad on the right. Narayan Prasad was a chartered accountant and a amateur photographer who's taken photographs of Delhi from 1940s, uh, late 30s, early 40s. R.V. Smith was a, again, both city residents. R.V. Smith was a journalist and he brought out this column in Hindu on the city of Delhi, which many of us and have, it's our introduction to all the stories around Delhi, which he collected by just talking and hearing with people. So here we are students who are going to different sites in Delhi, uh, the, the river, uh, learning how to use the camera and how to kind of make things with it. Uh, learning a recording device is very important with collecting oral narratives. And uh, there are now very many sites online that will actually give you that, that kind of information. Uh, but of course, there are also courses that help do it.
Thank you very much. I will stop my presentation right there and uh, open for discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful presentation. It was truly intriguing to learn about the way you have tried to record these popular memories, these human memories, and um, into into these uh, neighborhood museums and these recording projects. So, a question that arises is, what can be done for a pan Indian? Uh, uh, like, uh, what could be the pan Indian approach? of the project that you have been doing and from villages to cities and cities to states is this is that possible to do it on a state level or on a, on a national level i mean of course we can do it at a state level i mean if you've seen the examples i took are actually from three different parts of the country four states in fact there's manipur there was nagaland there was madhya pradesh and then delhi i mean i've been doing these collections now with groups of people who live in all these places and they've been wanting to collect and so my whole point was anybody who is interested in collecting or see none of it is rocket science it's very simple too the point is there are a few pointers which come out of uh, all i can say is years of experience which i'm willing to share and now much of this is actually uh, we do a course on uh, what we call digital storytelling and uh, delhi oral histories of delhi in ambedkar university so if you are an aud student you can do those courses we do otherwise courses like this elsewhere. The Oral History Association of India did workshops. Mm -hmm. So there are many other agencies also that do this kind of thing, the Delhi Story Project. So uh, these are, uh, so learning the kind of nitty gritty of how to do these uh, recordings is one thing. The other thing is actually knowing what to look for. And that is where I think uh, a little bit of experience helps. Mm -hmm. To begin with an oral history, never imagine you're an expert. Yeah. Never ever imagine you're an expert because there will be always somebody saying something that will catch you by surprise. Because you know, if somebody said, I know more about your own life, Surajit, than you do, if it were, unless it was somebody really close to me in my family, I would say, Kya baat kar rahe ho, yaar? And it's the same thing. Oral history, finally, you're asking somebody's personal story. So you yeah. can never imagine yourself to be a better expert than them, right? But what you will be better at is to know where to ask them from. Yeah. And if you know where a person lives, as an oral historian, one of your jobs is to find, get some background information about where you live, where such a, where that person lives and say, oh, yaar, yahan pe ye sab hua hai. all of this has happened, but I'm very curious why, or for example, they used to grow soya bean here and they never grow it anymore. Hmm. That's a big question. Uh, similarly, I don't know how many of you know, but uh, Punjab had a lot of cotton at one time till the 1920s. Uh, where has all that cotton gone? So that's a great story, a story for farmers in Punjab. What happened? Uh, and personal stories, family stories will tell you how every village, every district chose a different path before they landed up to where they are today. So yeah. it's a very much doable at a, from a village family to an all India level. Yeah, so um, if you can uh, list some limitations of oral history, what uh, they can be? The biggest limitation of oral history is one person's viewpoint. It is not a history that is accepted by a thousand million people. It's one person's viewpoint or it might be 200 people's viewpoint. Oral history is not everybody's viewpoint. It becomes everybody's viewpoint when you see it actually matches some other written record or some other record somebody has given from somewhere else. And you say, oh, they are saying exactly the same thing as what this person in this village was saying. That's when you draw a correlation. Oral history is all about making correlations. It's, it's not going to make you a historian. But it's, it enables you to correlate what happens at a place with the larger flow of history. It doesn't make you a historian, please. Yeah, so on that, uh, some oral histories might be affected with the personal tragedies like the partition. So I think that uh, uh, for that, I think your limitation might come, uh, might be visible, I think. 
So, so there is a question from Drishti Verma, and her question is: Shouldn't oral histories be recorded in textual form, which describe their experience as to be a more accurate source for people who will study them in future? So yes, I mean, uh, though a lot of people are doing the non-textual form as well, but one of the classical things you do with an oral history after you record it, if you recorded it, uh, is to actually transcribe it, and preferably. show the transcript with the person and or if the person can't read read it out with them spend an hour or so and just read it out because they'll be able to tell you yeah this is not what i was saying you've not understood it fully because there is many a slip between the cup and the lip what you hear and what you type are often very different especially if it's in a language or making a reference which is so local that you don't get so i agree with what the question uh, the question asked that it it should be transcribed and it is uh, it the job is incomplete if it has not gotten transcribed because once you transcribe it then it can go out to be used in other forms as well yeah you know historical sources and so on and so forth yeah uh, arti jaman's question is professor surajit uh, did you ever encounter audio artifacts from communities there's one very interesting example that comes up is uh, the one i was just showing you from uh, uh, the the question to irfan zuberi was what is the music living in delhi in old delhi in 1915 what would you be hearing he said the only recording that i have i've brought it with me today it's one of the first recordings of a something i'm forgetting what the form was he said it was recorded a few years later but i'm pretty sure it was exactly the kind of music that you could have been hearing but that's only one short example of six or seven pieces otherwise audio artifacts besides this i have not come i have come across um, tape recordings cassette tapes uh, but these would be from the 70s and 80s uh, we have uh, i remember going in kutch once and uh, discovering these three cassette tapes that were given to us uh, when we went there saying that uh, you wanted to know about this aap inko sun lo and ye hamare matlab the person had passed away the children kind of just gave it fine i mean we didn't have we don't travel around with cassette players these days so we said thank you very much and we came back in delhi when i played it it was in a language i couldn't understand and i said okay 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 it would be a dialect of gujarati spoken in kutch so then i asked friends around here ki can someone identify what this is to cut a strong long story short it took almost about uh, almost about a year before we found that it's actually nothing but the list but the various ways in which the dyes were made in that village it was a weaving village so it was just a listing Uh, oral listing of the different dyes made in that village at that time, which would be important information for a historian of textiles. Uh, but then, uh, talking about audio artifacts, I'm sure uh, textile art uh, historians, unless they go into the field, would not access things like this. Yeah, I think uh, the project uh, like neighborhood museum. So are very critical for uh, engaging the youngsters with history in a very uh, interactive way so uh, thank you so much sir for for doing the lecture for presenting your amazing presentation and for interacting with our audience i hope uh, everybody enjoyed it and thank you so much sir, for taking out time for your busy schedule thank you ishan thank you everyone uh, hope you can do get in touch uh, touch ishan has my email id if you want thank you bye thank you so much sir